Welcome back to The Final Whistle. I'm Drew Ziegler and I'm here with John Grant and James Gagusis. We are back and today we will talk about the NFL, MLB free agency, and college basketball. Our first topic today is the NFL and we're going to react to the week 14 games. What are your thoughts on the Giants getting killed by the Eagles 48-22? to um, I think it was pretty embarrassing. I mean the Giants got absolutely destroyed. It looked like they weren't even practicing the entire week. The Eagles were just faster and more physical. And, you know, the Giants made some dumb plays throughout the game, and they were out of it before the game even started. The Giants' 6-1 start was a fluke. They haven't won a game in five games. The Eagles are getting nothing but better. Jalen Hurts is playing like an MVP. What are they, 12-1? Mm -hmm. they're, they, they, they can take it all the way this year. The Eagles are just flat out a better team. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it was kind of upsetting to see the Giants lose like that. So I'm a Giants fan, yeah. but wasn't expected to win. Hopefully mm -hmm. we can still make the playoffs. And our next game is the 49ers versus Bucks, where Brady got thrashed by the 49ers. What are your thoughts on that game? Brock Purdy, man. <laughs> Mr. Irrelevant. He's out there and scores 33 points with his family in the stands. Versus Tom Brady, the best quarterback of all time. It's, just, it's amazing to see. Yeah, the 49ers, similar to the Eagles, they just outmatched the Buccaneers. I mean, Brock Purdy looked amazing out there. He... he he looks like a starting quarterback. The The offense was unstoppable, and the defense week after week is just dominant against any offense, no matter what. Yeah, Brady got destroyed by his childhood team, mm -hmm. and it was cool to see Brock Purdy's parents crying mm -hmm. in the stands. And our next game, Jets-Bills, where the Bills won. Mike White was getting destroyed in the pocket, getting sacked like crazy. What are your thoughts on that game? Yeah, um, the Jets didn't play awful. I mean, Mike White was struggling out there. I mean, he was fighting through injury, sort of like Herbert at the beginning of the year. I mean, the Bill, I mean, the Jets' defense, they held to digs to, what, like 30 yards, three receptions. Sauce Gardner, one of arguably the best cornerback in the league. I mean, if the Jets just had, like, just an average offense, they could definitely, like, make some noise in the playoffs with that elite defense. It's just unfortunate that the offense is so bad that, like, they can't – I mean, it's really tough for them to win games when you're scoring 12 points. I mean, Mike White, big football guy, two, got out of the game twice with injuries, came back in. He said that they would have to uh, peel me off that field. The Jets will never be anything until they get that offense there. Mike White, he's a decent quarterback, not going to win you a Super Bowl. Garrett Wilson is their only offensive threat. They have nobody else. The defense is the only reason they're winning games. Yeah, and I think the, when Brees Hall tore his ACL, yeah, that really killed him. I mean, if Brees Hall was still back, I think the offense would be much better. I feel when at the beginning of the year, he was carrying that offense, and yeah. that's why they were winning games. That could definitely open up some catches for Garrett Wilson also and open up their offense, make the, better decisions. The team that establishes the run game early and pounds the ball down your throat, they're going to win the game. They're going to win the game every time. Whoever has the better run game almost always wins the game. And our next game, Dolphins and Chargers. Chargers win at home. What are your thoughts on that game? I mean, the Chargers, they win a game, they lose a game, they win a game, they lose a game. I think that they're the most confusing team in the NFL. Some weeks they look great, some weeks they look bad. I, I, I really don't know. They're in the playoff race now. They're, they, I think they have the seventh seed. I think they make the playoffs, they can make a run. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the Chargers locked down the Dolphins. They were one of the best offenses coming into the game, and they shut down Tua. And it's yeah, it's really confusing. They they looked great yesterday, but like there's some games where like they look awful. So you know, I I don't really know how to feel about this. I mean, Herbert looked great through like 360 yards. I I hope they play like this for the rest of the year. They can make some noise in the playoffs, but they probably won't based on like the last season. Yeah, Tua was looking like his old self. Yeah. He was like throwing incomplete passes mm -hmm. all over. And Herbert got his wide receiver, Mike Williams, back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Keenan Allen had 12 catches, I think. They looked like they were back mm -hmm. to their self. Yeah. And there were also some injuries this past week. Debo and Kyler going down with significant injuries. Debo looks like he could be back, though. How will that affect the 49ers? Yeah, when he's out, I, I think the, it'll affect them. I mean, Debo is one of the best players in the NFL. I think the 49ers will be all right. Uh, I mean, it's very fortunate that he'll be, he's supposed to be back before the season ends, regular season ends. So I think I think the 49ers are still in a good spot. They got like a two-game lead in their division. I, I think even though Debo, it stinks that he's injured, I think they'll be fine. I mean, when you have a first-year quarterback coming in, you want them to have that go-to guy. He just lost his go-to guy in Debo Samuel. George Kittle, where has he been all season? Elijah Mitchell's out. 
He has Christian McCaffrey. That's a running back, though. He does not have that wide receiver anymore that he can just check the ball down to. I think that, yeah, the Jimmy Garoppolo loss might not hurt them as much, but this loss is definitely going to hurt the 49ers. I think McCaffrey is as good as a receiver. He is a running back, though, and he could be even better with Purdy throwing down to him and depending on him. And for our Week 15 matchups next week, our first game, 49ers at Seahawks on Thursday night football, a great Thursday night football game. Who do you think is going to come out on top? Well, I mean, Seattle, Sunday, lost to the Panthers. Geno had the worst game of this season. The def the run defense is it's an abomination. It, it's, it's terrible. It's one of the worst run defenses I've ever seen. They're letting up 200 yards to Deontay Foreman and, and, and some no-name running backs. I think that if anyone's going to beat the 49ers – it's their rival, the Seattle Seahawks, but seven and six now. Geno Smith had his worst game. The defense is terrible. I don't know, and the 49ers are really hot. Um, yeah, in this game, I feel like the 49ers is, it's a really good matchup for the 49ers. I think the 49ers defense is gonna shut down the Seahawks. Uh, I think that defense is so elite. I think the, even though Debo is not gonna play, I think the 49ers are still going to come out with the win. I think their offense has looked really, really good. I think the best it's looked all season, and I, th I think they're going to win. I think Kenneth Walker could really help the Seahawks out, but 49ers defense is elite, and defense wins championships. I mean, it just shows how good of a coach Kyle Shanahan is for the 49ers. They could have DoorDash drivers <laughs> as their entire <laughs> offense, and they're still winning games. And our next game, Dolphins and Bills, another huge divisional game. Who do you think is going to win that one? The Dolphins, the last two games, they've not looked good. The Bills, I mean, they didn't beat the Jets by a lot, but I got the Bills in that game. Um, I think it's going to be a really close game. I think the Dolphins are going to win. I don't think the Bills have looked, played really well these past few weeks. Even though the Dolphins played pretty bad last week, I don't think it's going to happen again. I think Tua is going to play a good game, and I think Tyreek's going to go off. And I think they're going to win by you know, one possession, I think. Dolphins had heaters in Los Angeles, <laughs> and now they're in Buffalo. Mm -hmm. What are they going to – they're going to be freezing. Yeah. They're not used to that weather. Yeah. Let's see how they can play with that. Mm -hmm. And on Sunday Night Football, we have the Giants and the Commanders. Winner probably makes the playoffs, losers out. Who do you think is going to win that one? Yeah, this is a really important game. I, I, even though I think it's a home game for the Commanders, I think the Commanders are going to win. I don't. The, they've been playing really good football, and the Giants have played terrible football. I think the injuries really killed the Giants' season, and I think it's going to show. I think the commander's offense is going to run right through the Giants' defense, and I don't, they, they're going to win by multiple possessions, I think. I think Brian Dable's going to have the Giants' players pumped up more than they've ever been all season for this game. I feel like this game is a game that is make or break for the playoffs, and they're going to be ready, and they're going to win the game. Daniel Jones is also at his best when he's in <laughs> FedEx field, so hopefully that can help yeah, him. Yeah, but it's also prime time, so... yeah. He's also never won a primetime game. So. But if they get Leonard Williams back, stop the run, and get some sacks, and maybe a Dory Jackson at corner, that could definitely help them. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Steven, and we'll talk about MLB free agency. Welcome back. Now we are joined by Steven Cubis to talk about MLB free agency. There were a lot of huge moves this offseason already. The biggest one, Judge, going back to the Yankees after we thought it wouldn't happen. Thanks, John Heyman. I mean, uh, I, don't know, I honestly I wanted to see him in San Francisco. Yeah, I'm a Met fan. It would hurt to see him maybe in the playoffs. But, like, I, I, I honestly didn't want to be on the Yankees because I don't like the Yankees. I hate the Yankees. And I think if they would have had him, I would have made fun of every Yankee fan I knew. And it would have been a great day for me. Yeah, for a while we thought – for 10 minutes we thought he was going to be a giant. You know, that was a good 10 minutes, but it all came crashing down. I, I, I mean, I think the Yankees had to make that deal. If they didn't, the Yankees fans would have, I don't even know what they would have done. The house might not, might be dead if that happened. But I think the Yankees had to make that move. It's not a great contract. I wouldn't get $40 million to a guy who's been injury prone, but they had to do it. If they, there was no way they, didn't, they couldn't make that move. Yeah, and there, but there was one New York star who did leave the Mets. Going to Texas, Jacob DeGrom, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's unfortunate. You know, his legacy, uh, he's not going to be that all-time Met like Keith Hernandez or Tom Seaver. He, he's not going to be that type of guy, which is unfortunate. But, I mean, he took the bigger contract. Um, I was a little surprised to see the, the, the Rangers give him that fifth-year and a sixth-year option, you know, compared to the Mets offering him only three years, even though it was higher uh, AAV. 
after, you know, I, I would probably take the Rangers deal too. I mean, yeah, it stinks that he's not going to be in Matt, but, you know, life happens. Yeah, I was really uh, really sad when I opened up my phone and I saw he was on the Rangers. I mean, I think he's taking the Ranger deal, so he goes to Texas and gets that tax-free money, so he's loaded with money. Because in New York, there's a high tax rule, you know. But I, I'm very sad. We lost an amazing pitcher. I think the Texas Rangers will ruin his legacy because they're a fourth-place team in the division. Like, I don't know how they're going to beat the Astros. Like, it's really hard to beat them because they're so talented. And he also gets hurt a lot, which is, like, not really dependable. So, yeah. They already spent a lot last offseason with Simeon and Seager, and they were still not a good team. So let's see how the ground can help them. But the Mets did bounce back with Justin Verlander, Cy Young pitcher. What are your thoughts on that? Man, I love I love Justin Verlander. I mean, he's he was on the Tigers one World Series, on the Astros one World Series. I'm hoping the Mets World Series. But I'm also excited to see Kate Upton in the stands. You know, I think that brings a little joy to City Field. Everybody's going to go there, maybe see Kate Upton. But we also get a Cy Young pitcher who's – who's old but still got the game in him, and I can't wait to see him pitch. Yeah, as long as he stays healthy, I think this will be a good deal, even though $43 million is a lot of money. You know, if he's that Cy Young pitcher from last year, it's going to be a great deal for the Mets. He's really going to impact the team, help the team, it's just as long as he stays healthy. If he doesn't, it will be a terrible contract, but I think he'll stay healthy. Steve Cohen doing it all for the Mets, spend so much money. He wants that World Series. Are they going to get it? Um, I think – I think they have a much better chance this year than last year. You know, DeGrom only pitched, what, seven, eight starts last year. Didn't really impact the team. I think they have a much better chance. I think their uh, rotation's much better, much deeper. I think having, like, Senga and Quintana at the three and four is much better than last year. I think our rotation's a lot healthier, and I don't see anybody really getting hurt. You know, maybe Max Scherzer, but, like, it's only one out of the five, I think, will get hurt. And... What won't help them, though, Trey Turner joining the Phillies, $300 million, where he was offered 342 from the Padres. How are the Phillies going to be this year? I don't know. I think the Phillies spent their money the wrong way. I mean, their, their offense was amazing last year. Like, you can't deny it. Even I hate the Phillies. But I think they're dumb because pitching is what they needed. They had no pitching. I mean, yeah, they can score five runs, but if you have no pitching, then the other teams, are, like Astros, are going to put up the runs, too. But they got the pitching. That's the reason why they won the World Series against them. Yeah, I was devastated when I saw the news. I, I hate Trey Turner. I hated when he was on the Nationals playing him 19 times a year. Um, but I, I think it was a pretty good move. I mean, they're not paying Turner an absurd amount of money, like $27 million a year. But to go 11 years, I mean, his speed isn't going to – in like what, five years from now, the speed, his speed isn't going to be the same. I think the Phillies – I think getting Trey Turner definitely upgrades the team. I think the reason why they were so good last year in the playoffs was because the pitching was good. As If their pitching is good this year, they'll definitely be a World Series contender, but that's a big if. You know, that's not guaranteed. We're all biased here. We're all Mets fans. But uh, who is the best contract this in the winter meetings now? Um, I think the best contract, I mean, Kodai Senga's was really good. I think he's only getting paid $18 million a year, and he has a really, really high ceiling. That could be an amazing deal for the Mets. I don't even think that no buy is intended. I think that that's a really good deal for the Mets. I think the Mets had a uh, – the, the I think the best signing was definitely Justin Verlander because, like, you can't really bounce back with many guys after the ground, but I think they did it with Justin Verlander because he's a Cy Young winner last year. He's four years old, but he's coming off, like, amazing years ever since his Tommy John. So I think this is great for the Mets. I think, sadly, Trey Turner, I think he's just a beast. Yeah. He is. He can do it all, five-tool player. But who was the worst contract this offseason? Uh, I think the worst contract was Tywin Walker to the Phillies, $72 million. I mean, that's a lot of money for someone who can't pitch in the second half of the season. I mean, uh, I would per I'm would. i glad the Mets didn't give him that contract. There's no way. I would be fuming if the Mets outbid him and got him. Even with Steve Cohen, you know, money isn't really the problem. But that's stupid money going to, you know, an average at best player. I'm going to have to agree with that. The Phillies seem to pick up on the Mets uh, pitchers after they uh, go into free agency, but like James said, he's a he's a first half monster, and then second half he forgets how to throw a baseball, and then he becomes the worst pitcher in the league. So I'm going to see how he does in Philadelphia. Who was your surprising move for this offseason? Oh, Xander Bogarts for sure, man. I didn't think he was going to the Padres. I think he'd – any other team actually, because I thought the pa – because the Padres have Tatis, so it's like – what are they going to do with him now since they have Bogarts? Are they going to move one over or not? Because in a conference they said Xander Bogarts is playing shortstop. So now I'm like, 
a little shook to see where Tatis Yeah, I agree play. with that. I did not expect Bogarts to go to the Padres. There were, like, talks that the Red Sox were, like, close to signing him. Now their momentum to signing him. And I was really shocked when I saw – woke up in the morning, I saw Padres signing Xander Bogarts. So I think it's a good deal. I mean, moving Tatis maybe to right field or left field. Um, but that lineup is, uh, like, loaded. But I was really surprised. I think the Red Sox are just making their team worse and worse. They lost Mookie and Bogarts, and now Devers is on his last year. I don't know what they're going to do with him. And who is your um, – what are predictions for the rest of the free agents, including Carlos Correa? Uh, uh, for Carlos Correa, I think he's going to go to the Cubs. I think the Cubs are all in on him. I think they'll really uh, – they really need him, and I think they'll benefit from him. For Rodon, I think he's signing with the Yankees. I don't think the Yankees let go of him. I think I think they'll zero on him. They'll give him that seventh year, and I, th I think it'll be 170, 180. That'd be my prediction. And Dansby, I think the Dodgers are going to get him. The Dodgers have been way too quiet to not make moves. They haven't been in on anybody. I think their payroll is under 200 million, which is unheard of in the past, what, five years. So I think they'll definitely get Dansby. I think that'll be a really good upgrade for them. I think Dansby's going to... Uh the Dodgers too because of Freddie Freeman. I think that's gonna be a little connection and again. They're gonna come back to reunite with each other. I think Carlos is right on. It's gonna go to the, it's going to the Baltimore. I think Baltimore is trying to make a nice little push here, and I think they might land Carlos Correa too because their team is they're not bad. They the, I think they have top three catcher in the league with Ali Rushman. I think they add an amazing pitcher and a really good bat. They can make a really good. Push. If Steve Cohen really wants to win, could he bring in Correa and just? Go for it all this year. Oh, a hundred percent, he could. I mean, he's been he played with uh, Verlander and he's best friends with Lindor. I mean, we saw it in the trade with with Baez mm -hmm. that he came over to New York because like the relationships he's had. But I think if the Mets bring Carlos Correa, the Mets won the World Series. Yeah, even though that would be great, I don't, I don't think that's happening. I think I think that's way like I don't think that's ever gonna happen I think sure when like Scherzer signed with the Mets and Verlander signed with the Mets that made sense I don't think Correa would want to play third base I think he wants to play shortstop get that shortstop money and I don't think Mets if the Mets pay him 35 million to play third base I mean it, it's fine I, but I don't think they're gonna make that deal if the Yankees don't get Carlos Rodon isn't it just a loss of an offseason they didn't make their team better yeah they just brought Judge back yeah they made no upgrades and they made the they're paying Judge 20 million more so uh, if they don't bring back Rodon I think they got to do something in the trade market I don't I don't even know who would they get in the trade market but they got to get someone to upgrade the team otherwise they'll be even worse from last year you know it's the same old Yankees they don't they need their one big player and then it seems like they're done but I think the trade deadlines when they really start to like heat up with players they really they do a really good job at the trade deadline and when we come back we're going to talk about the beginning of the college basketball season welcome back now we will talk about the beginning of the college basketball season number one in the preseason rankings unc and they haven't been playing well at all what are your thoughts on them i have a big smile on my face because i'm a diehard duke fan and it's great seeing them not even in the top 25 they're terrible this year i mean the ACC is actually really good this year, which is like a shock. They have a bunch of really good teams like Virginia Tech, Miami, Duke, you know, Wake Forest even is even good this year, Georgia Tech. I think UNC is going to have a tough time in the ACC, and it doesn't make it better is when they lose to Duke twice this year, and it makes me feel good. Yeah, um, when, even when they started off 5-0, and they were not winning games by a lot. Like, I feel like every other game was a close game, and then when they're on that four-game losing streak, you know, it really showed they're not the number one team in the country, and it's it's confusing because they played so well last year, especially in the tournament, and they have the same team, and they're just playing awful basketball. Yeah, I think Huber Davis should ask Roy Williams for some advice. And a team that has been playing really well, though, Virginia, can they make it like they have been in the past? Yeah, I think they've been really good. Uh, it's been a couple of years since they've been really good. And I think they could definitely make it. They they got a really good roster. They had some big wins against Baylor and Illinois. I think they could definitely make it. You know, they got good defense. They always have good defense. And, yeah, I, th I think they can make it. They're off to a hot start. Yeah, Virginia, no, I'm not really a big fan of them either, you know. But they're they're playing really good basketball. They had an impressive three wins: Michigan, Illinois, and Baylor, of course. Uh, but again, the ACC is really it's gonna be really tough this year, especially conference play. Conference play is never like easy for any team, no matter how good they are. But they're really good, so I can't wait to see how they do. A surprise team, UConn, has been playing really well. Can they be a really good team in the tournament? Uh, I'm gonna say yes, but 
their conference isn't as great as the other conferences like the SEC and the ACC. But like they, they have to pair up against teams like 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 in those conferences like the Big Ten too. I want to see how they like pair up against maybe like a, a Miami or something like that, like a really good like team that's not as high as they are rated. And see how they do. Yeah, UConn, uh, they've had some good wins. Uh, if they beat like Vill- a team like Villanova or Providence, even though Villanova has been good that year, that'll definitely be an impressive win, and I'll definitely be sold. But I think right now, I think they could definitely make some noise in the pl- in the tournament. Uh, Gonzaga has been playing all right. They haven't been playing really well, and they're not in a good conference. Shouldn't they be playing better? Yeah, you, especially when they're in a the bad conference, you expect them right now to be at least nine and one, not seven and three. They have some bad losses, some you know losses that they usually win. It's kind of weird to say that Gonzaga's been underperforming. Yeah, Gonzaga lost to Purdue by like 20 points. Like they, the team, they played uh, two out of their three losses were against ranked teams, and they got blown out. And that really shows how like different they are this year. And I don't think they're really the same team. They're not playing well at all, and I don't, I don't think they really have a chance even winning their conference. Their star player Drew Timmy, he's been great for a while now, but he hasn't been shooting that well. And can he lead them though? I mean, yeah, but for a player like him, I think it's 50 years, super senior. Um, I think to, to be a leader in a team, you got to be able to do, like, everything. I mean, he's a terrible, like, free throw shooter and a three-point shooter, but, like, he does get a lot of boards. He does put up a lot of points, but I think he needs to upgrade his game just a little bit more if he wants to carry this Gonzaga team all the way. Yeah, I agree. I think he has to, he has to play better for Gonzaga to really be that number one tournament team. If he doesn't, if he doesn't put step up his game, I think Gonzaga is in a little bit of trouble. And the guy who's even a lot taller than him, Zach Eady from Purdue, is he a really great player? Can he lead Purdue and can they win? Yeah, I mean the problem with him is you know sometimes he gets in foul trouble, but if he's in the game majority of the game, Purdue's winning that game. I'd say 90% of the time, as long as he doesn't get fouls, I feel like he's a monster uh, on the boards. You know makes all the rebounds. I mean, when you're seven foot four and you can rebound really well and score, I mean, you're pretty much unstoppable. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he helped the team last year tremendously, but this year is even way more of an impact. You know, seven four, two eighty five, big man. I mean, when you watch them play against Duke, their signature when that got him into the top five, he was rebounding any ball that went near him. Like anything that went near him, no matter how big the other guy was on Duke. It was it was automatically his board. He's just unstoppable in the paint. And UNC, they got all their players back, it seems like, but they're not playing well. But they do have their star player, Armando Baycott. Oh my God! Don't get me started with him. He killed my Duke team in the Final Four last year. You know, he he's he's that guy. Like he gets every board. He puts up points. He shoots. He's basically the star player in that team. Basically, does everything that you need a star player to do. They're just not performing well. Yeah, he's pretty much like a shorter um, Zach Eady. I mean, he's not as tall as him, but he, he gets, what, 20, 25 rebounds a game, also putting up 20 points. He's an unstoppable force out there. I think, you know, he, he's been playing really well, so it's not really his fault. UNC's been playing bad. So I, I think I'm confident that he can play well. It's just about the guys around him. And that's all we have today. Thanks for tuning in to the final whistle, and see you next time.